Shall we pray? Our Father, we come before your throne boldly because we come in the name of Jesus. And we know that when we pray in the name of Jesus, you answer our prayers. So we ask that you will be with us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Enlighten our minds to understand, open our hearts to receive, and Lord, through your power, make us obedient children. We ask that as we study this very important lesson, that you will guide us, and we claim the promise of your presence, because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. After Jesus described the order of end time events, beginning in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4 through verse 31, Jesus used an illustration of nature that would indicate to his followers when that coming would be near. He also stated that before that generation passed away, all of these things would be fulfilled, and they were in the destruction of Jerusalem. He also stated that uh, heaven and earth might pass away, but his word would never pass away. In other words, Matthew 24 would be fulfilled just as he said. So let's read Matthew chapter 24 and verses 32 to 35. Here is the lesson from nature so that we can know how near the coming of Jesus is. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, now comes the comparison, so you also, when you see all these things, that is everything that he said in Matthew 24, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So he uses the analogy of the fig tree to teach the soon coming of the Lord in power and glory. Now, dispensationalists, those who believe that uh, Israel, literal Israel, is being reestablished by God according to His plan, believe that the fig tree of Matthew 24 is a symbol of Israel and that the budding of the fig tree represents the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in the year 1948. According to those who have this view, the reestablishment of Israel as a nation in 1948 is the greatest sign that the coming of Jesus could come at any moment, that it is even at the door. Therefore, we must examine this passage more carefully to see if this concept is true. Now, it is true that in the Old Testament, the fig tree and the vineyard are symbols of Israel. Notice as one example, Hosea chapter 9 and verse 10. God speaks about Israel and He said, I found Israel like grapes, there's the vineyard, in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first fruits on the fig tree in its season. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves to that shame. They became an abomination like the thing they loved. The New Testament also uses the fig tree and the vineyard as symbols for Israel. What we want to do in the next few minutes is examine three passages that refer to the tree in uh, the Gospels. And so let's go to the first one. It's found in Matthew chapter 3 and verses 8 through 10. And after we examine Israel as a tree in the New Testament, we will examine Israel as the vineyard in the New Testament. John the Baptist began his ministry six months before Jesus began his. In his message, he compared Israel to a tree. Matthew 3, 8 through 10. Here John the Baptist preaches, Therefore, bear fruits, 
worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which was, does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So he calls to repentance. He rebukes them for claiming to be children of Abraham when they didn't have his spirit. He compares uh, them with a tree that is supposed to produce good fruit. And if it doesn't produce good fruit, it will be cut down and cast into the fire. And he also told them, you know, God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones if he wants to. Now the stones that Jesus mentioned here were not literal stones. He wasn't pointing to literal stones. The axe in this, on these verses is symbolic. The trees are symbolic. The fruit is symbolic, and the cutting down of the tree is symbolic, and the burning of the tree is also symbolic. So the stones also are symbolic of something. John the Baptist is saying, don't think to say, you know, we are children of Abraham. God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. What do the stones represent? In the Desire of Ages, page 107, Ellen White wrote the following. Speaking about the Gentiles and the soldiers who were gathered there to listen to John preach and some of them to be baptized. Their hearts might now appear as lifeless as the stones of the desert, but His Spirit could quicken them to do His will and receive the fulfillment of His promise. So the first passage that we notice concerning the tree is John the Baptist calling Israel to repentance, saying don't boast because you're children of Abraham. God can raise children of Abraham from these Gentiles, and you better produce fruit, because if you don't produce fruit, you'll be cut down and cast into the fire. Now we go to the second episode that refers to the tree. This is about two and a half years after Jesus began His ministry. He told a parable that has many of the same common elements that the message of John the Baptist had. Let's read the parable in Luke 13, verses 1 through 9. There were present at that season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, remember that's a word that John the Baptist used, unless you repent, you will all also, you will all likewise perish. Then he gives another example. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, again the same word that John the Baptist used, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish, which is the same as cutting down the tree after it withers. Verse 6, he also spoke this parable. Now he's going to give a parable. A certain man, this is God the Father, had a fig tree, Israel planted in his vineyard, that is the world, and he came seeking fruit on it, that's the fruit of the Spirit, and found none. Verse 7, Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, that's Jesus, Look, for three years, the timing is important, John the Baptist had preached six months, Jesus was two and a half years into his ministry, that's three years. Look, for three years, I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. So in three years since John the Baptist began preaching, the fig tree, Israel, had borne no fruit. And so the owner of the vineyard says, cut it down. That's just what John the Baptist said. If the tree doesn't produce fruit, cut it down and cast it into the fire. So cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? However, he, that is Jesus, answered and said to him, uh, that is to the Father, Sir, 
let it alone this year. Jesus still had one year of ministry remaining. Let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. So if in the last year the tree does not bear fruit, the fig tree does not bear fruit, cut it down. The parable ends in suspense because you don't know if the fig tree produced fruit or not. It's kind of like the story of the prodigal son. The story ends with the father trying to reason with the prodigal son, who by the way represented the Jews of Christ's day, self-righteous. They, they, you know, the, the older brother criticized his, uh, his brother for going out and sleeping with harlots and, and spending all of his father's money, ending up among the swine. He was critical of him because his father uh, called a party for him and he said, you know, if anyone deserves a party, it's me. So he represented the arrogant Jewish nation of Christ's day. But the story of the prodigal son ends with the father trying to reason with the older brother and, uh, you know, we don't know whether the older brother actually uh, accepted the rebuke of his father or not. You know uh, when Jesus is crucified that he did, but when he told the story, no. Now let's look at the third reference to the tree. This is at the very end of the final year of Christ's ministry on earth. We're going to find once again the same tree that John the Baptist spoke about and that Jesus spoke about in his parable. Matthew 21 verses 17 through 19. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, and he lodged there. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry, so Jesus was hungry for fruit. Verse 19, And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves, and said to the fig tree, Let no fruit grow on you ever again. And immediately the fig tree withered away. Now the Gospel of Mark adds an important detail that we don't find in the story in Matthew. This was not really the season for the fig trees to produce figs. Those who have orchards um, with fig trees know that the fruit comes out first and then the leaves announce that the tree has fruit. This fig tree was unusual because it had abundant leaves but it had absolutely no fruit. Notice Mark chapter 11 verses 12 through 14 where we have the parallel passage. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany he was hungry and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves. If it had leaves he says this fig tree has to have fruit. So he saw a fig tree having leaves. He went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it he found nothing but leaves. And here's the little detail. For it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Ellen White described the ostentatious nature of this fig tree, having an abundance of leaves, but being devoid of any fruit. In Desire of Ages, page 581, she wrote, It was not the season for ripe figs, except in certain localities, and on the highlands about Jerusalem, it might truly be said the time of figs was not yet. However, in the orchard to which Jesus came, one tree appeared to be in advance of all others, just like God chose Israel as His special people before all nations. So once again, we find, however, in the orchard to which Jesus came, one tree appeared to be in advance of all the others. It was already covered with leaves. It is the nature of the fig tree that before the leaves open, the growing fruit appears. However, its appearance was deceptive. Upon searching its branches from the lowest bough to the topmost twig, 
Jesus found nothing but leaves. It was a mass of pretentious foliage, nothing more. In harmony with Scripture, Ellen White interpreted this fig tree as an acted parable that represented Israel. I read from Desire of Ages, page 583. Jesus had come to the fig tree hungry to find food. So he had come to Israel hungering to find in them the fruits of righteousness. He had poured out abundant blessings upon the nation of Israel. In Desire of Ages, page 583, we find these words. He had lavished on them his gifts. With what purpose? That they might bear fruit for the blessing of the world. Every opportunity and privilege had been granted them, and in return he sought their sympathy and cooperation in his work of grace. So notice God doesn't simply give blessings so that we are blessed. He gives us blessings so that we can bless others. Then she finishes the statement, He, that is Jesus, longed to see in them self-sacrifice and compassion, zeal for God, and a deep yearning of soul for the salvation of their fellow men. So you notice here that God lavished Israel with blessings so that they would then become a blessing of salvation to the entire world. And because the fig tree had nothing but pretentious leaves, Jesus cursed the fig tree and it withered away. The very next day when Jesus and the disciples went by that particular place, Mark 11, 20 and 21 tells us what had happened to that fig tree. It says there, Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Now you know when a tree dries up by the roots, that's it folks, it's dead. There's no possibility of resurrecting it. So once again, now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you, you cursed has withered away. What did Jesus mean to teach when he cursed the fig tree and it withered away, drying up by the roots? I want to read now three statements that we find in the book, The Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages 582 and 583. The cursing of the fig tree was an acted parable. That barren tree, flaunting its pretentious foliage in the very face of Christ, was a symbol of the Jewish nation. The Savior desired to make plain to His disciples the cause and the certainty of Israel's doom. Another statement, withered beneath the Savior's curse, standing forth, seared, and blasted, dried up by the roots, the fig tree showed what the Jewish people would be when the grace of God was removed from them. Refusing to impart blessing, they would no longer receive it. In one final quotation, all the trees in the fig orchard were destitute of fruit, but the leafless trees raised no expectation. See, the leafless trees represented the Gentiles just like the stones in the times of John the Baptist represented the Gentiles. So she says all the trees uh, in the fig orchard were destitute of fruit, but the leafless trees raised no expectation and caused no disappointment. These trees represented the Gentiles. They were as destitute as were the Jews of godliness, but they had not professed to serve God. They made no boastful pretensions to goodness. They were blind to the works and ways of God. With them, that is with the trees that represented the Gentiles, with them the time of figs was not yet. So John the Baptist had warned that if the Jewish tree did not produce fruit, that God would cut it down and cast it into the fire. This is what happened precisely with Jerusalem. 
In the year 70, we're told in Matthew chapter 22 and verses 1 to 14, actually verse 7 is the specific verse that mentions it, we're told that Jerusalem was destroyed and it was burnt with fire. Now there's another passage in the Gospels that describes a fig tree. This passage is found in, found in John chapter 1 and verses 43 to 48. So let's read this passage and then make a few remarks about it. This is John 1 verse 43. The following day Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. And Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, if there are Israelites indeed, then there must also be Israelites not indeed. In fact, the word indeed that is used here, where Jesus says that Nathanael was an Israelite indeed, actually means genuine or real. That's the reason why, for example, the NIV translates the expression, a true Israelite. The correctness of the NIV translation is proved by the fact that verse 47 tells us that in Nathanael there was no deceit. In other words, he was a true, genuine Israelite. Why did Jesus single out Nathanael as an Israelite indeed? Verse 49 provides the answer. Verse 49 tells us that uh, Nathanael confessed that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah of Israel. In other words, Nathanael accepted Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He accepted Him as the Messiah. That's what made him an Israelite indeed. It appears significant that Nathanael was an Israelite indeed, and he was under a fig tree that represented Israel. Interesting, so you have the symbol, which is the fig tree, and that which the symbol represented, Nathanael the true Israelite, together. Thus in the passage we have a symbol and what the symbol represents. The Israelite indeed that sat under the fig tree was a true Israelite because he recognized Jesus Christ as the Messiah, the Son of God. Would that mean then that those who rejected the Messiah as the Son of God would be Israelites, but not indeed? We'll come back to that in a little while. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 24 to determine if the fig tree that is mentioned in this chapter represents the Jewish nation. You see, just because the fig tree in some passages represents Israel doesn't necessarily mean that it represents Israel in every passage. So the question is, in Matthew 24, 32 and 33, does the fig tree represent Israel, and does the budding of the fig tree represent the reestablishment of the Jewish nation as a nation in the year 1948? Well, let's notice Matthew chapter 24 and verses 32 and 33. Jesus said, As you see the fig tree bud, it is a sign that the summer is near. In the same way, now comes the comparison, in the same way when you see all these things, not only the sprouting of the fig tree, but when you see all of these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Now why do I mention this? Because dispensationalists believe 
that the reestablishment of Israel as God's nation in 1948 is the sign that the second coming of Jesus is imminent at any moment, even at the door. So they take this one sign and they say, this is the sign of the soon coming of Jesus. But we see here that Jesus refers to all these things indicate that the coming of Jesus is near, not only the budding of the fig tree. The parallel passage to Matthew is in Luke 21, 29 through 31. It gives us additional details. So let's read those verses. It says, Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. Notice it's not only the fig tree, it's all of the trees. When they are already budding, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things, it's not talking only about the, the fig tree in 1948. It's saying when you see these things happening, that is all of the signs in Matthew 24, know that the kingdom of God is near. In Luke, Jesus did not single out the budding of the fig tree, but he also said all the trees. So the fig tree is just one of many trees that when you see them bud, that's symbolic of all of the signs that point forward to the soon coming of Christ. Now Israel is also spoken of as a vineyard in the New Testament. So let's go to Matthew chapter 21 and verses 33 through 46. Matthew 21, 33 through 40, actually 45. I'm going to interpret it as we go along. Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner, that's God the Father, who planted a vineyard, that's Israel, and set a hedge around it, that's the law, dug a wine press in it and built a tower, that's the temple, and he leased it to the vine dressers, the Jewish leaders, and went into a far country, heaven. Now when the vintage time drew near, and he sent his servants to the vine dressers. These servants that are sent are the ones that are sent before the Babylonian captivity, the true prophets of God. So once again, now when vintage time drew near, he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit. And the vine dressers took his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another like they did with the prophets, the true prophets in the Old Testament before the Babylonian captivity. So does God give up? No. Verse 36, again, he sent other servants, this is after the Babylonian captivity, more than the first, and they did likewise to them. Then last of all, this has finality to it, then last of all, he sent his son, that's Jesus, the father sends his son, Jesus, to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. In other words, the one who is going to inherit the promises. Galatians 3, verse 16. But when the vine dressers saw the Son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. This is the death of Christ. And seize his inheritance. So they took him and cast him out of the vineyard. Jesus died outside Jerusalem and killed him. And now Jesus asks, Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? They still hadn't understood that he was talking about them. Verse 41, they said to him, He will destroy those wicked men miserably. That's the destruction of Jerusalem, by the way. And lease his, vine his vineyard to other vine dressers, that's the Gentiles, who will render to him the fruits in their seasons. And now Jesus is going to explain what the parable means. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone, that's Jesus, which the builders, the Jewish nation, rejected, has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then Jesus makes this prediction. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. In other words, the kingdom no longer belongs to literal Israel. Will be taken from you and given to a nation 
This is the Gentiles. The Greek word is ethne, given to a nation, bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone, speaking of himself, will be broken. In other words, whoever receives Jesus as Christ and Savior will be converted. But on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. In other words, a person who does not accept Jesus will eventually end up destroyed. Verse 45, Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. Last of all, he sent his son. There was no other recourse that Jesus could take with the Jewish nation. The Jewish theocracy came to an end, and now the gospel commission is fulfilled by another nation, the Gentiles. Now let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter 8, verses 37 to 45. Remember that we talked about individuals who are genuine or true Jews, and you have others who, even though they are descendants of Abraham, they are counterfeit Jews. They're Jews, but they're not. Now you say, that doesn't make any sense. Well, then what I'm going to read from the mouth of Jesus doesn't make any sense either. John 8, verse 37. Jesus is speaking to, the, to a group of Jews there, and he says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, that is literally, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you, is what Jesus says. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. So Jesus says, I have a father, and you have a father as well. He's working up to a point which is very, uh, very, very politically incorrect. Notice verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if, notice this is conditional, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. So Jesus is, is contesting whether they are really children of Abraham. He's saying, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But, now notice this, but now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham did not do this. In other words, there's a disconnect between you and Abraham. Abraham loved me, you hate me. So how can you say that you are the children of Abraham? It's not like father, like children. It continues in verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Still he hasn't identified who their father is. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. Jesus said to them, notice if again, if you, God, were your Father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. So as what he's saying is, my Father loves me, and you despise me. So how can you say that God is your Father if you say that you despise me and the Father actually loves me? There's a disconnect there. Notice verse 43. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And now he's, he says this very politically incorrect statement. You are of your father the devil. Who hated Jesus and wanted to see Jesus dead? The devil. So did they have the same spirit of the devil? Absolutely. So you are of your father the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources. For he is a liar and the father of it. This reminds us of the passage about Nathanael. You remember that Nathanael was a true, genuine Israelite because he confessed the Messiah and in him there was no deceit? Well, in the last part of these verses, we find an emphasis on the truth. Jesus says, when Satan speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. 
Now the amazing thing about this passage is that the Jews were literally children of Abraham. But spiritually, Jesus said, you are not children of Abraham because you are children of the devil. You want to do what the devil wants to do to me. In the physical sense of the word, they were children of Abraham, but in the spiritual sense, they were not. Incidentally, the Apostle Paul repeatedly taught the same truth. Let's read several verses now from the writings of the Apostle Paul where he taught the same truth that to be a genuine Israelite means to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. We find in Romans chapter 2 verses 28 and 29 that the Apostle Paul contrasts those who are outwardly Jews with those who are inwardly Jews. This is how it reads, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Because the Jews, they prided themselves in circumcision. They said, this is the sign of the covenant. This is the sign that we are God's true people. And yet Paul is saying, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So the Jews, they prided themselves in obeying the law to the very letter, but they lacked the spirit. The religion was not in the heart. And their praise was the praise of men. They prayed in public places. They gave alms to be seen by men. The Apostle Paul says, no, 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 no. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. The Apostle Paul picks up on the same idea in Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. For they are not, listen this, this statement, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. So what if I said that not all Israelites are Israelites? You would say, Pastor Bohr, that is a ridiculous statement. And yet the Apostle Paul is saying, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. Nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. Not all the seed of Abraham are really children of Abraham, is what the Apostle Paul is saying. It continues, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. Who came from Isaac? The Messiah, folks. In Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, that means literal Jews, descendants of Abraham by blood, that is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise, that is, of the promise of the Messiah, are counted as the seed. Let's notice also Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 through 29. The Apostle Paul repeatedly makes this point, that a genuine, true Israelite or Jew is one who has received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Galatians 3, verse 26 reads as follows, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. So how are we sons of God? We are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, we're all sons of God in terms of creation, but we are not all sons of God in terms of redemption. We have to accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord to be sons of God in terms of redemption. For it says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And by the way, Ephesians 2 says that Gentiles become one with the Jews. They become one people according to Scripture. And verse 29 says, And if you are Christ's, 
then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So the question is, what does it mean to be the seed of Abraham in spiritual terms? It means that if we are Christ's, we are Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed is not defined genetically or biologically. It is defined by a spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 through 8. Philippians chapter 3 and verses 3 to 8. Here the Apostle Paul is speaking about his conversion experience. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Notice who is the circumcision? those who literally are circumcised Jews? No. The Apostle Paul says, we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. And then he reminisces about his experience. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Oh, he's claiming gr a great heritage here. But now notice what he says. However, what things were gained to me, all this list that he's provided, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ. Hope you're understanding this. So you say, what does this have to do with Matthew chapter 24? Well, dispensationalists believe that the budding of the fig tree is the reestablishment of the nation of Israel in disobedience because they're still rejecting the Messiah. What I'm trying to show here from Scripture is that the budding of the fig tree there and of all the trees, all of the signs are signs of the coming of Christ. In that sense, the fig tree does not necessarily represent Israel. Jesus is using it as an analogy to show that when these signs take place, the coming of Jesus is near. So now let's ask the question, does the church replace Israel? You know, there's this big debate in the Christian world today among evangelicals whether Israel is replaced or re whether Israel continues, whether God still has a plan for Israel. Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 49 and verse 28 to answer the question, does God replace Israel with the Gentiles, or do the Gentiles continue the legacy of Israel? In Genesis 49, verse 28, we find that the Old Testament church, so to speak, began with 12 patriarchs that then multiplied into a great nation composed of 12 tribes. It says there in Genesis 49, verse 28, all these, that is the sons of Jacob, because Jacob has listed his sons in this chapter one by one, all these are the tribes, are the twelve tribes of Israel. And this is what their father spoke to them. And he blessed them. He blessed each one according to his own blessing. So these twelve sons of Jacob then multiplied and they became a single nation. They became the twelve tribes of Israel that multiplied greatly. God then called Moses to deliver his people from bondage. When Moses was born, the great dragon that uh, Pharaoh is called in Ezekiel 29 verse 3 was there attempting to kill him. But Moses then delivered Israel from bondage and the sign of their release was the blood of the lamb placed on the doors of the faithful Israelites. And then Moses organized 12 tribes, uh, organized 12 tribes that then entered the promised land. 
Now, this is very interesting. So Israel begins technically with 12 individuals that grow into 12 tribes, a huge nation composed of many people. What was the mission that God had for choosing Israel and multiplying it into a nation? The fact is that their only purpose was to prepare the world for the arrival of the Messiah. If they failed in their mission, they had absolutely no reason to exist. Notice Isaiah 49 in verse 6, and by the way, when I say no reason to exist, I'm not saying that the state of Israel has no reason to exist. Of course it has a reason to exist as a nation, but what I'm saying is it has no reason to exist to fulfill the purpose of preparing the world for the Messiah. Uh, you know, and we're not here being anti-Semitic. In fact, God has many faithful people within uh, Judaism, many people that have not heard about the Messiah that will come over to the Messiah's side when they hear the truth as it's found in Scripture. What was the mission of Israel? Isaiah 49 verse 6. Indeed, he says, speaking to his people, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. In others, I haven't chosen you only to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. In the Old Testament, it was God's plan that Israel be so prosperous and that they were so faithful to God that all of the surrounding nations would come and say, what is the secret of your prosperity? What is the secret of your peace and your abundance? And they would say, ah, we serve the Messiah. They would prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah to this world. God called them to be a light to the Gentiles that they should be God's salvation, as it says here, to the ends of the earth. Unfortunately, literal Israel failed in its commitment. Before the Babylonian captivity, it intermingled with the nations and adopted their cultural practices and religious practices and idolatry. And after the Babylonian captivity, Israel shut herself in a self-righteous armor, isolating herself from the nations. For this reason, Jesus chose 12 faithful apostles, all Jews, to continue the legacy of Israel and to fulfill the mission that the Hebrew theocracy had failed to fulfill. The twelve then preached Jesus, and as a result, the church became a great nation, so to speak. Remember Jesus said, the kingdom will be taken from you and given to a nation that produces the fruits thereof. That's a, a, a word that refers to the Gentiles. You see, the mission of the church is the same mission as the Hebrew theocracy. Only the Hebrew theocracy was to prepare the world for the coming of the Messiah. The church is to announce that the Messiah has come and that He is the Savior of the world. I'm sure that you've read Matthew chapter 28 and verses 18 to 20 where you have the great commission that Jesus gave to the disciples. Let's read those verses. Verse 18, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Interesting. That was the purpose for God choosing 12 apostles that then multiplied into a great nation, so to speak. Now, Revelation chapter 12 is proof that God has only one true Israel with one mission. Faithful Israel of the Old Testament, as I was mentioning, is one with the faithful New Testament church. If you go to Revelation chapter 12, you'll notice that a single woman represents the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. God does not have two women. That would be bigamy, by the way, if God had two, uh, two wives. 
Really, God has only one woman in Revelation 12. The woman that brings the Messiah into the world, that's the Old Testament church, that's why the woman has a crown with 12 stars on her head, and then that woman flees to the wilderness for 1,260 years, that's the New Testament church. That's why Jesus began uh, uh, the Old Testament church with 12 uh, individuals that multiplied into 12 tribes, and that's the reason why he chose 12 Jewish apostles that then multiplied and became a great Christian nation. Ellen White wrote in Acts of the Apostles, page 19, As in the Old Testament, the 12 patriarchs stood as representatives of Israel, so the 12 apostles stand as representatives of the Gospel Church. It is no coincidence, folks, that uh, we find in Revelation that the foundations of the city have the names of the 12 apostles and the gates of the city have the names of the 12 tribes. It's only one city with all of the redeemed from the Old and New Testament. The church does not replace Israel. The church continues the legacy of Israel and fulfills the mission that the theocracy failed to fulfill. We're told in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 10, that Abraham looked for a heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. The great heroes of Hebrews 11, they understood that the literal Jerusalem over the Middle East is not the ultimate hope of the Christian. The hope of the Christian is the heavenly city whose builder and maker is God. In fact, all of the heroes of chapter 11 of Hebrews looked for the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly and these are the Old Testament saints that are looking for the heavenly city. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 13 through 16. Hebrews 11 verses 13 through 16. After mentioning several of these heroes, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. In other words, they were seeking a homeland. What homeland were they seeking? Literal Canaan? Literal Jerusalem? No. Let's continue reading. Verse 15. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better. These are the Old Testament saints, folks. But now they desire a better that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared for them a city. In 1948, the Jewish nation was still rejecting the Messiah, and therefore 1948 could not be a fulfillment of prophecy, because the Bible says that God scattered Israel at the destruction of Jerusalem because they rejected the Messiah. So why would he gather them in disobedience while they are still rejecting the Messiah? Ellen White wrote some very solemn things about earthly Jerusalem. In Review and Herald, February 25, 1896, she wrote, The curse rests upon Jerusalem. The Lord has obliterated those things which men would worship in and about Jerusalem. Yet many hold in reverence literal objects in Palestine, while they neglect to behold Jesus as their advocate in the heaven of heavens. In another statement that we find, Review and Herald, June 9, 1896, it reads like this, How many there are who feel that it would be a good thing to tread the soil of old Jerusalem, and that their faith would be greatly strengthened by visiting the scenes of the Savior's life and death. However, Old Jerusalem will never be a sacred place until the refining fire from heaven cleanses it. The darkest blot of guilt rests upon the city that refused the light of Christ. Do we want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus? We need not seek out the paths in, in Nazareth, Bethany, and Jerusalem. We shall find the footprints of Jesus by the sickbed, by the side of suffering humanity in the hovels of the poverty-stricken and distressed. We may walk in these footsteps, 
comforting the suffering, speaking words of hope and comfort to the despondent, doing as Jesus did when He was upon earth, we shall walk in His blessed steps. Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When the sin-cursed earth is purified from every stain of sin, when the Mount of Olives is rent asunder and becomes an immense plain, this is after the millennium, when the holy city of God descends upon it, the land that is now called the Holy Land will indeed become holy. However, God's cause and work will not be advanced by making pilgrimages to Jerusalem. The curse of God is upon Jerusalem for the rejection and crucifixion of His only begotten Son. However, God will cleanse away the vile blot. The prophet says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth are passed away, and the sea is no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, I want to make clear that we're talking about the Hebrew theocracy. We're talking about Israel as the nation to fulfill God's purpose of taking the gospel to the world, the gospel of the Messiah. The Hebrew theocracy, literal Israel, failed, but the Christian church continues the legacy, continues the mission, and will finish the work. We are not referring to individual Jews. We're not referring to the nation of Israel as such. There are many sincere people among those literal Israelites. They don't understand that Jesus is the Messiah that they've been waiting for. The seat that is left empty is to be filled by Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, who was rejected when Jesus came to this earth. God has a passion and a love for the individual Jews in the Jewish nation. He wants to see them saved. He wants them to see, a, a see them accept the Messiah as Savior and Lord so that they can experience the salvation of God. So may this be not only the experience of the literal Jews, but also of us who are spiritual Jews accepting Jesus. Mm -hmm.